Hi, welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. Tonight on the show, we have a very special guest with a very interesting story to tell, one story that she hasn't told publicly. So we're really honored to have Dr. Elena Michaels, formerly of the Source Family Commune, located in Los Angeles, headed by Yehoah, otherwise known as Father Yod, formerly Jim Baker. Her Source Family name was Electra Aquarian. Dr. Elena Michaels, are you there? Yes, I am, William. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview. I really appreciate it. I think you have a very fascinating tale to tell. Uh, Miss Michaels was a member of an interesting uh, alternative community in Los Angeles that has been written about by a variety of different people, particularly Dave McGowan wrote about them. And there was a very interesting uh, documentary uh, made about what was known as the Source Family. And Dr. Elena Michaels was in the family, and we'd just like to have her tell her story. So, uh, Dr. Elena, could you give us a little bit uh, of information about your background? Sure. Well, I grew up in Ohio, and I came to California after I finished my undergraduate studies in Ohio. And I was living in San Francisco, the San Francisco area. That's where I met my husband, in the Haight-Ashbury, actually. So were you, in the Haight. were you there during the Summer of Love or that era? No, I came out in 71. 71. Oh, so you're, okay, gotcha. Summer 71, yeah. And and we had some friends who were uh, very close to us, and one of them, the the man of the, of the couple, actually gave us a book, and I read the book, and that's what made me want to come to the Source family. But one of the things that was really interesting is... We were very financially stable. I was selling advertising for an alternative newspaper, um, and we had a beautiful flat in San Francisco, and it was furnished beautifully, and I was painting and doing artwork and dealing in authentic Native American Indian jewelry, going to the reservations, getting the jewelry, bringing it back, and selling it to stores and creating jewelry of my own. So very, very creative. And we had a wonderful place to live. We weren't barefoot hippies stoned wandering down Sunset Boulevard who wandered into the Source restaurant. We were together. We were fully functioning, highly educated. And we had been together, my husband and I, we weren't married at that time, but we came into the Source family together. Okay. And that so was... I read this book called Liberation, which was a book that was written by Jim Baker, who later became Father Yod, who later became Yehoah. And when I was living in San Francisco, I was doing all kinds of paranormal, occult, metaphysical, spiritual things. Um, I had meditated with Satchitananda in Ohio. I had gone to past life groups. I have done, I had done all kinds of exploratory things into consciousness. And I was definitely into expanding my horizons in any way that I could. Uh, I'm kind of an intellectual, I guess, kind of a bookaholic. So I had done a lot of reading and a lot of experiencing of altered states. Okay. So, <clears throat> Excuse me. At the time that I read this book, I thought, well, gee, here's something else that I haven't really explored, and I'm going to check this out. So we drove with this couple down to what was then known the Father House. And where, where was that located? That was on Nichols Canyon, okay. up the up the hill. Up the hill from up the sunset, hill on right? Canyon. Yeah, uh huh. It was up a long driveway, and there was a house at the end. And we arrived there, and everything was. We, we arrived there before morning meditation. So morning meditation for us in the Source family was. You know, I usually get up around three o'clock in the morning. You know, if you could get to bed at nine o'clock at night, you'd get a good six hours. So it was dark, and there were candles everywhere, and the smell of frankincense and incense wafting through the rooms and beautiful people very quietly. We didn't talk at that time of the morning, so no one was really talking. And we 
waited in a room that we could, was called the band room until it was time to come in to morning meditation. And before morning meditation, everyone would silently, we had certain rituals that were in the source family. The first thing that would happen is you would, well, I'll tell you that later after okay. I got into the source family. But my first visit was everybody, I walked into this big, giant grand room and there were candles and incense everywhere and some people were sitting on cushions no one was talking and then there was a single file going up to Yehoah's bedroom mm -hmm. and I got in line I was motioned by my friend to kind of get in line and I got in line and went up into the room and as I got closer I could smell the smell of cannabis and as I inched into the room and it was my turn I walked into the room and I saw that everybody had knelt down in front of him. He was sitting in a chair. And so when it was my turn to walk into the room, I walked into the room and knelt down in front of him. And he said something like, look how beautiful she is or something like that. And I looked at him and he looked at me and the penetration and the connection between us was very, very strong. And he said to me, what is your name, sweetheart? And he said, is it Rachel? And I said, no. And he said, he started laughing. He says, oh, that was our last lifetime together. And then he said, it took you long enough to get here, didn't it? I've been wanting you to come. And that just kind of blew me away. And then there was a pipe that was put in my mouth and he looked at me as he lit the flame. And I took one inhalation and the way we did it was called, you take one inhalation for six seconds and then you exhale the name of God, which is Yahweh. So I took the inhalation and then I exhaled and I said, Yahweh. And that was it. Boy, I was flying. One inhalation. And Went that, back downstairs. I'm sorry. Well, what I was, was just going to say, was the... Was that your first experience with marijuana? No, okay, not there, at all. How many people no, were there I had, in the room? I had... <laughs> not at all. Okay. No. So, how many I mean, people when I was in there... college, when I was... Gotcha. Go ahead, what? Oh, I was just going to say, how many people were there in the original house and in his room when you walked up there? When I walked into the room, there were probably, oh, I don't know, maybe 15, 15. 20 people, maybe 15 people that could see me, 20 people that could see me, because there was a, the snaking line of people around the doorway, and so not everybody who was on the stairs could look into the room. Gotcha. But when we came downstairs, everybody was sitting down quietly, getting ready, waiting for him to come down. And he came down, and he led morning meditation. And it was amazing. He what, was... What kind of style of meditation did he practice? Do you know? Yes. Well, all I can tell you, I don't know. It, it's, it's hard to label it. I would have to say eclectic. He didn't do the standard kind of meditations that I had seen and practiced. He didn't do sit, sitting silent Zen meditation or, or anything like that. He basically came downstairs and sat in this big chair. And behind him was a big picture window where you could see the lights flickering of the city of Los Angeles because we were up on a hill. And there was a big gong next to him, big, you know, like, I don't know, maybe six feet tall or something like that. And with, with the big mallet and he, and a little table next to him. And he just sat down cross-legged or not cross-legged. And it was different for me because I had the kind of meditations that I had been a part of or, seemed to have rules and you had to sit a certain way and you had to think a certain thing. He just came downstairs and just kind of let it flow. So he, he, every morning meditation was like that. It was, it was different every day. And he started by chanting and everybody chanted along with him. And what he chanted were various phrases. One of them was Yehoah. Like it, it kind of went like this. Yahweh, 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 and then over and over, and other ones were different vowel sounds, things like that. Mm -hmm. And when you have a room that is full of people 
over a hundred people chanting the same thing and everyone is on the sacred herb, which is what we called it. And in a meditative state in the ascending hours of the day, which are before the hours right before sunrise, it's very, very powerful. That time of day is very, very powerful because there aren't a lot of thought forms in the ethers at that time because most people are asleep. So when you are awake at that time of day and you are putting conscious thought into the universe, you can create some pretty powerful things and you have power to make changes and create things in your life that aren't available when the sun is up and it's daytime and there's everybody else thinking about things, all these other thought forms moving around in the ethers. How long and was, I know that even, I'm sorry. How long was morning meditations? Oh, it depended. It wasn't rigid. We would probably start at around four and maybe, and we went till the sun came up. Oh, interesting. And I, I know that even, you know, I taught meditation for a while in my office in Santa Clarita. I have a private practice in Valencia now, but my office was in Santa Clarita in a different area in Newhall. And I taught morning meditation there for a while. And we started at five o'clock in the morning. I knew I couldn't ask it. I knew I couldn't get people to get there at four o'clock in the morning. So I, I started at five o'clock in the morning and then I moved it to five thirty in the morning. And even then it was a powerful time when you would have several people sitting around the beautiful ambiance, the incense, the candles, it kind of puts you in an altered state. And when everyone is chanting the same thing, it's like one mind, one voice. When you first saw Jim Baker, can you describe, describe what he looked like, how old he was, yeah. what he wore? Sure. He was, I think he was either 52 or 53. I think he was 52. And I, he was very charismatic. He was a tall man. He was a well-built man. He had long hair. He had a long beard. He didn't believe in cutting hair or cutting the beard or shaving. He had beautiful blue sparkling eyes and he had a very strong presence. And I had been with a lot of people with powerful presence and I have sat in front of many people with powerful presence. And I had even before that time, but n not like this, this was, he had a very powerful presence, very charismatic. So, he, so back to what the, yeah, he looked exactly ahead. like the pictures were in the source documentary. Is that true? When you first saw him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But he had different looks. Sometimes he had a stern look. Sometimes he had a warm, friendly look. Sometimes he had a thoughtful, studious look. Um, he was an avid reader also. So sometimes there was a, you know, a photo of him with the glasses on or reading or something like that. But he, he definitely was quite charming, I guess you would say, but charming in a very powerful otherworldly kind of way and I knew the moment I met him when I knelt in front of him and he lit that pipe I knew I wasn't going to leave him I knew I was there I was there for the long haul and my other life with the beautiful clothes and the jewelry and the fabulous flat with full of antiques and the great life in San Francisco I knew it was going to change radically. So I knew. did you stay gonna... there? Did you stay there in Nichols Canyon at his place or did you go back up to San Francisco? Well, we had the morning meditation and then after the meditation, he called my husband and I to come and sit in front of him and he, he gave us our names and he looked at me and he said, this time around, you are Electra. And he looked at my husband and he said to him, his name was David, and he said, and you are Orbit. And my husband was kind of disappointed that his name was a heavier name. <laughs> he said, afterwards, he said, you got a really cool name and I got a dorky name. <laughs> anyway, so he gave me the name Electra, which was the name, of course, of the Greek play. But also it was the name of a star in the Pleiades, one of the seven sisters. Gotcha. And he said to us, he said to both of us, but I remember him kind of really strongly focusing on me. And he said, do you think I'm God? And I think everybody's God. So I said, yes, because I did. But I didn't think he was the only God, but 
he said, do you think I've got it? And I said, yes. And he said, well, why don't you go back to San Francisco and tie up everything and come on back? And then he called one of his sons and he said, son, take them to the airport. And that was kind of it. They took us to the airport and we went back to San Francisco. And I think my friends thought I'd had a nervous breakdown or something because I had beautiful vintage clothes from the 1940s. That was kind of my thing. I liked wearing vintage clothes from the 1940s, you know, right. the jewelry, the suits, the, the heels, everything. And we called everybody we knew and we said, come over to our house and take what you want because we're leaving. And I remember the sensation I had at that time. It was almost like I was looking at a photograph of my life and my house. I mean, I had a beautiful yoga room in this flat. We did yoga every day. And I had an art room with an easel and my paints and all of my art supplies. And I can remember having the sensation and a beautiful kitchen with floor to ceiling jars of herbs because I've I was very into herbs then, as I am now, as a naturopathic doctor, but I had been studying herbs for several years, even before I went to the Source family. Gotcha. And our beautiful kitchen and our beautiful back patio and everything. And I remember feeling like I was looking at a photograph of that, and I could almost feel like the corners of the photograph were curling down, and it was basically ending just a chapter ended. So, do you remember how old you were yeah. at that time i was 23 oh gosh so you were i was 23 gotcha. college educated double undergraduate degrees debt graduate on the dean's list you know gotcha. but also when i was in college i was what is now known as a creative you know i was in the art department the theater department i was doing a lot of consciousness expanding things out in the country in Athens, Ohio, where I did my undergraduate work and just doing a lot of, uh, you know, experimenting, reading all this Huxley and, right. you know, all of the psychedelic kind of things that were going on and doing a lot of writing. So I was, you know, more into that scene than I was into the Greek scene or drinking or anything like that. Gotcha. Do, you, so, do you, just to kind of trace back a little bit, when, when Baker or Father Yod called somebody his sons, they were... Um, his kind of spiritual sons, is that correct? Yes. Gotcha. He also had his own birth sons. Oh, he did? I didn't know they, that. Yes, he had his own birth sons, too. Okay. Uh, yes, but they he had basically moved into a different dimension and taken on more consciousness, as he described it, and left that life behind and started this new one. I see. And he got married to a woman uh, who was a lot younger than he was. Her name was Robin, and she became a Om in the family, A H O M. And so everybody got a different name, and basically your past was over. That was it. Your past was over. So at the end of that time of giving away everything, uh, we packed our car with some things we thought would be usable to us in the Source family. We put a couple of beautiful, beautiful antique rugs in the car. We had a station wagon. I put all of my art supplies in the car. My husband had a, a beautiful set of snap-on tools, uh, you know, the, the big red floor-to-ceiling case, you know, so we took all the tools out and we took our tools and my camera and my paints and my jewelry supplies and some of my clothes that felt more goddessy than 1940s. And we got in the car and said goodbye to that flat and headed back down to Los Angeles. And when we came back to Los Angeles, it, we were gone for three days. It took us three days to get rid of everything. And we did it fast. I mean, I was in a hurry. I wanted to hurry up and get rid of everything and get back gotcha. because I was ready for the next chapter, the next journey. Gotcha. My husband was not so interested. Even when we left the first time to go down with our friends, he wasn't going to come. Because he was very happy in San Francisco. He was doing well financially. He didn't want to leave all of that. Mm -hmm. But I was hooked by the spiritual piece. And I remember we, we were on a second floor flat. So I remember going down and getting ready to go back with my friends. They were going to take me down. They were on their way back themselves. They had come to tie up some loose ties of their own in San Francisco. And I came back up the stairs to say goodbye to him. And I remember he was lying in bed with earphones on listening to music. And I came back up because I had been getting things ready to go. And I came back up and I said, well, I'm leaving. 
And he said, he took the earphones off, and I said, well, I'm leaving. And I gave him a kiss and a hug goodbye. And he said, well, wait a minute. Maybe I'll just go to. I just, I don't want to stay. I, I just want to check it out. I said, well, I'm checking it out, too. But I really feel a strong pull to go. He says, well, I'm going to come, too. So he came downstairs, and we got in the van, and we went down. That was the first time when we first went down with our friends. Gotcha. And so then when you moved down, they were expecting your return. Is that correct? Well, I think Yahoo knew I would be coming back. And I think that's the reason he was kind of focusing on me that first morning after meditation, because he probably figured that if he could get me, he could get my husband too, because he could see the connection that, that my husband and I had with each other. And, and he was right because I wanted to come back gotcha. and, David came with me, just to, quote, check it out. But once he got there, he had a hard time. But he also was, I guess you could say, seduced on a lot of levels by the beautiful women. The men were beautiful and the women were beautiful. We were all into health. I had been very into health, even in San Francisco. Uh, very into eating whole foods, organic foods. Very into the meditation thing. Very into herbs homeopathics, all of that. So it, none of this was like new to me or foreign to me. It was just like an acceleration. And Yahweh always used to say that, and at one time he even said to me that life in the source was like a PhD in spirituality because it was very concentrated. It was very intense. And there were a lot of changes. Things were changing all the time. If you weren't in morning meditation, you did not know what had happened and no one was going to tell you about it either because we lived in the now gotcha. you know we lived in the now so everybody at the everybody at his place went to morning med meditation so the entire everybody went to morning meditation, meditation. Gotcha. except if a woman was nursing or had a child she would maybe stay out so that the babies wouldn't be you know interrupting or <clears throat> disturbing the meditation I see. anyway it was very beautiful at the source uh we had a restaurant, and I worked at the restaurant. I was a hostess at the restaurant, and we had a lot of celebrities come in. And, and that was one the one that was on Sunset, Sunset, and, and Sweetser. Uh, yes, Sweetser, Sunset and Sweetser. Right. And someone told me at one time that that restaurant was the most successful natural foods restaurant in the country per square foot at that time. We had beautiful food, very much into consciousness and meditation, and in the serving of the food and. And the food was delicious, and we ate the highest quality food up at the Father House too. Did that you was own, were only beautiful... source? Just a sec. Were only source members the uh, employees of the restaurant, or were there other yes. people? Yeah. Okay. No, just, just the people the from the source. Gotcha. Maybe it was the most successful because nobody got paid. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how that figure ever came as far as being most successful, but none of us got paid, of course. But there were some interesting in the documentary. They featured a couple films that were shot at the restaurant. Right. Was yeah. So, the Woody, went, the Woody Allen film, Allen, right. where uh, uh, Annie Hall, Annie where Hall. he said he, he 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 comes into the restaurant on the terrace and he's feeling very awkward because everybody's very hip and beautiful and he's kind of nerdy looking, you know, in the in the film and and he sits down and a beautiful waitress sashays over and he she says, "What can I get you?" And he goes, "Well, I'll have a plate of mashed yeast." <laughs> mashed yeast, which is really funny, you know, sprouts and a plate of mashed yeast. Because that's not anything that we ever served, but it was just like a nerdy guy's way of trying to say something hip to a beautiful Aquarius-style waitress. But anyway, this, the, that, that time at the Father House was very magical. One of the things that was interesting to me, though, is, you know, a lot of the information that is put out there about the Source family is that it was a big fairy tale and it was every, it was wonderful and everybody was so loving and everybody was so sharing and it was just the ideal community. And that actually is not the way it was. That's a glossy version. It wasn't like that. And I remember thinking how strange it was that some of the women were um, mean almost to me. And I, I remember thinking, this is supposed to be your consciousness group and we're supposed to be loving with each other. And why is this person being saying snide things to me or behaving this way toward me? I, I remember thinking that was so odd. And, and did, when did, did this start right when you moved in or how did it kind of yes. develop? 
No, it started right when I moved in. Not all of the women were like that, but I, I was stunned that several, more than a few, were like that and or were completely ignoring you, complete like you were invisible. Gotcha. And then, of course, there were a couple of others who I'm still friendly with who were very warm and welcoming. But I, that was one thing that struck me. I thought, well, this is kind of an incongruous thing. I don't quite get this. The men were very kind and very respectful and very loving. Not pursuing, though. The men in the family didn't really pursue you. Um, that was kind of Yahoo's thing, is that the women were allowed to go where they wanted. And that's kind of one of the storylines, too, in the book and in the movie, the, the documentary that was done, is that the women were allowed to choose who they want and no woman ever had to do anything she didn't really want to do. Well, that's not really true either. So because what's the, what's the truth? Pardon me? What is the truth then if that wasn't true? Everybody has their own reality. And I was actually assigned to someone to be with that man. One of the things Yahweh seemed to want to do was to kind of break down your protection and get you to a place where you could have bigger spiritual growth. That's what he would say. And so David and I came in together. And David and I are still together, by the way. We're the only couple that came in together that are still together. Interesting. And he, several months down the line, he assigned me, he called me into his room. He had one of his women who is kind of uh, almost like a, a speaker now and a spokesperson from the source uh, who says, you know, calls herself one of his wives um, and calls, you know, she's kind of very predominant on the scene with the source, but she's actually the one that came down to get me. And she said, uh, she took me upstairs to see Yahoo. This is by the time, by this time we were already living in Hawaii. We sold the source restaurant gotcha. and we were living in Hawaii. How long, and, were you in, how long were you in LA with the group? We came in 1974 and we were part of a group of about 15 or 20 that stayed behind to close up the source restaurant as it was sold to another party. And so we were the last group to get on the plane and come to Hawaii. And then what year was that? Well, that was 74. That was 74. Okay, we sold so. the restaurant at the end of 1974. Okay, I misunderstood. So when did, and you got there in 71, is that correct, or 72? No, no, I came to California in 71. 71. So I came to Marin County in San Francisco in 1971. And how, what, what year did you move to the Source uh, family? 1974. Okay, so you were just there for like a year before they packed up and left to Hawaii, is that right? No, they packed up. Well, there was, they went to Hawaii a couple different times, Okay. but this was the last trip to Hawaii. The final trip to there Hawaii was, trip was when we sold the restaurant. So we sold the restaurant and it was 1974, the end of 1974 when we sold the restaurant gotcha. and came to Hawaii. The last group came to Hawaii, okay. moved to Hawaii. So we were living in Hawaii. And, uh, at this point when, I was called up to Yahoo's quarters, and he assigned me to one of the other sons who I went with. I mean, I did what I was told. I it's crazy. Do you think he did what? that with a lot of the other women? I don't know, because nobody talked about stuff like this. You didn't talk about what had happened in the past. You didn't talk about what your name was before. Mm -hmm. You didn't talk about what you did before. You didn't talk about what you, where you came from. It was only the now. Gotcha. That's all that it was, was the present time. Did you, were you aware from the beginning of what uh, Father Yod was doing with kind of uh, his kind of polygamous practices? Of course. Okay, so you knew. But everything was created in a way that, let's put it this way. I was there for him. That's why I came. I came because I wanted to know what he knew. I wanted to learn from him. I wanted to study and get the wisdom that he seemed to have. And that's why I was there. I wasn't there to live in a fun commune. I wasn't there because it was cool. I wasn't there because uh, of some guy I met on Sunset Boulevard who happened to be a member of the source. I came because 
when moment our eyes locked, Yahweh's in mine, I knew I was not going to leave him. And I did not leave him. I see. And he, I mean, so, he had a great amount of wisdom. I mean, he was very well read. Do you think that that's true? Yes. Yes, I think so. So, you know, the, he had women around him, and he created a situation. First of all, in, in his life before, Jim Baker was kind of a player. You know, he was kind of a ladies' man. He had had affairs. He never could feel like he was monogamous. Uh, I had talked to um, one of his wives and one of his wives, who is the mother of his children. And he, she said he, he kind of created a situation that fit what he wanted. He wanted to have multiple women and have it be okay. Gotcha. So he had multiple women, and many of them were very, very young. And he created a situation where he was the heaviest, he was the highest, which was true. And the, I wanted to be there. Right. I wanted to be as close to him as possible. I wanted to learn what he had to say. I wanted to be around him. Gotcha. I wanted to get the wisdom. When, and so, right. I mean, do you think, yeah. what kind of wisdom did you learn from Father Yod? Well, when I met him, he was Yehoah. Yehoah, sorry. Okay. He had already called himself Yehoah. Okay. Um, I learned a lot of things that, that I have carried through even into my life now. Uh, things about a lot of things, uh, things that came out years later, you know, all kinds of things, law of attraction. Uh, we talked about ancient principles. We talked about the Emerald Tablets. We talked about the, the, uh, uh, the rules of the universe. We talked about the ancient mystery schools, lots and lots of information. Interesting. And that's the part that I loved. After a while, it got weird. Because that wasn't being talked about so much, and he started to get a little more paranoid. Gotcha. Do you and think he was associated it, or learned any other information from other groups or doctrines? Yeah. Or, okay. Of course. Okay. Yeah. He like was, what? He was with Yogi Bhajan for a while. Yogi Bhajan. Yeah, he was with Yogi Bhajan as Jim Baker, and then he kind of spun off and did his own thing, and would do meditation classes and invite the public, and that's how he built. It's very easy for someone who is 20 or 30 years older than someone else. Let's put it this way. The other night, we saw a movie. I don't know if you've seen it. It was called Enlighten Us, The Rise and Fall of James Arthur Ray. You know who James Ray was, right? Yeah, who, who was that? The guy in Arizona where those people died yes, in okay, that sweat lodge. Yes. Uh -huh, okay. Uh -huh. No matter... What? It's part of human, human nature to search and want to find out the answers to life right. and the answers in the universe. Totally it's agree. human nature yes. to do that. Yes. Now, even now, after everything that James Ray has done, he still has a whole new group of followers. Even in the movie Holy Hell, I don't know if you've seen that, uh, even after Netflix, all of that exposure, he still has more followers. Right. Uh, and even... People want to be led. They want to follow someone who is dynamic, who seems to have answers that they don't have. And human nature is like that. Yeah. And so when you know, you... Us to have a lot of answers and a lot of explanation. And I knew I could learn a lot from him. And that's why I was there. And I gotcha. tolerated incredibly unpleasant experiences to be there. Gotcha. And do you, I mean, how long was your total time with the source? Well, it depends what you define as with the source. Okay. Because Yahweh died in August of 1975. Gotcha. And we, well, I stuck around for a long time after that. So I'd have to say about four and a half years. Four and a half years from beginning to end, is that correct? Yeah. Uh-huh. And can you recount yeah. for people, um, well, let's talk about, like, your experience there and how your relationship with the group and Father Yo developed up until he passed away. Well, like I said, when we moved to Hawaii, there were a series of things that happened. I mean, there were some other, I mean, we were moving constantly. We were always moving. I mean, we would move into a place 
And when you talk about a hundred and some people living in some place, the landlord's not going to be too happy about that. So we were always kind of on the move and looking for places to go. But he would leave morning meditation every morning, regardless of what day it was or where we were. And it was always put into a spiritual framework of, well, we're wandering, you know, like the 40 days and the 40 nights, we're wandering in the desert looking for our home like the Israelites, or everything was put into a spiritual connotation. So we all just followed along. And I'll tell you something. If he had said drink Kool-Aid, we would have done it. If he had said whatever he said, most of us did it. So this thing about, oh, you could do whatever you want, and you could leave whenever you want, and the women could do whatever they wanted to do, and they could go be with whoever they wanted to be with, and they never had to do anything that they didn't feel was right or that they didn't want to do. It's kind of a bunch of crap, because that's not what it was. This was a cult. It took me years to realize that this was a cult. I am, by my profession, I'm a licensed psychotherapist in the state of California. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm a clinical hypnotherapist. I'm an intuitive. I also happen to be an actress. And I was an actress, you know, years ago, even before I went back to school to get my doctorate and everything, but uh, have, have in the last few years been doing more and more of that, um, been called in to do more and more of that. But the, the thing is, is that it took me a long time to realize that I was in a cult. And there are still many people in the source who don't realize they were in a cult. You couldn't leave. You know why? Why? Because there was the stories of the people who left and went insane. The stories of the people who left and committed suicide and were ending up homeless or people who ended up homeless on the street because they couldn't handle the light, quote unquote. They and weren't this was a, strong enough this, spiritually. Did these stories the all come from Jim Baker or Father Yoke? Yes, okay. this is what, what he would talk about. And this is what would be discussed in you know, morning classes. Oh, so-and-so saw so-and-so on the street and he's homeless now because he couldn't handle the light. So there's a subtext is if you leave, you're not heavy enough, spiritually aware enough, or able to handle the light of the consciousness that he was trying to transmit. Okay. So who wants to leave? Who would want to leave and admit, admit that they weren't, that they were an unconscious doofus. Nobody would want to leave and admit that. Just that a, quick, the, a quick question, Dr. Elena. What would you think the average age of his followers was? was? Well, I was on the upper end. There were, you know, 12 and 13-year-old girls that came in there. Interesting. Uh, and I think that when I was there, most of them were younger than me. So he had basically Most of the a group people on the of, source were younger than me. Right. So he had people who were between 18, 23, and he was 52. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I mean, a couple were, uh, my husband was 28, I think, or 29. And, uh, but this, a lot of the, a lot of them were really young, especially the, the women were young. And, um, and so the, the idea was, the, the subtext was being with him was the best. The subtext was being with him was, was better than being with one of the lowly sons, even though he would always talk his sons up and he was very loving toward his sons, but he could also be incredibly stern and cruel. And there's another thing going around where, you know, people have made up T-shirts and they say the most famous thing he said was, just be kind, just be kind. And how he always said, just be kind, just be kind. Well, I don't think I ever heard him say, just be kind any more than once or twice. I mean, it wasn't like a motto or a family creed, but that has been created to be like a family creed to, to perpetuate this glossy fairy tale version of how wonderful life and the source was. I saw him in morning meditation. I never missed a meditation and I sat as close to him as possible. I wanted to be as close as I could. And there were many mornings when we would have guests come and he was, mean and cruel and made fun of them and laughed at them and we all laughed too we just emulated him we did everything he did <clears throat> especially his sons did everything he did the men in the family and you know i remember um you know many situations where people would leave because he had 
been so mean to them. They had come as guests to check him out, uh-huh. and he had said horrible things to them. So, so some were, people, it seems like he sought out younger people to recruit, and then mm-hmm. some people he uh, alienated intentionally. Is that correct? It depended on his mood. It depended on his mood. I mean, when he had a, a lot of us living with him, he, it wasn't so much about recruiting new ones or using the word recruiting. And, and he didn't really call it recruiting. He called, he said that we were a family. And when there were bickerings or cruelties or misunderstandings, he would say, oh, my children, just like a normal family, my children fight with each other sometimes. My children argue. Sometimes there are misunderstandings. But he separated himself from all of that. He was surrounded by women who waited on him and who served him. That was what the role of a woman in the family was, to, quote, serve their God-man, you know, make their food, serve them, make their coffee in the morning, comb their hair, wash their clothes, uh, make their clothes, uh, you know, massage them every night before bed. And there were, they, those were angels. They were called angels. And then there was a mother angel. So here is Jehovah with multiple women. And he had a, quote, mother angel. And so the idea was his sons wanted to have more women, too. So some of them who had more charisma would have a couple of women. They might have one or two women and one of them or even three women. And one of those women would be a, quote, mother angel who wouldn't do as much of the work as the angels would be doing. Do you know and how many children? It, do you know how many children came out of the Source family? Well, I had born? two. You had two, gotcha. Yeah, I had two, and uh, some of the children came to the Source family with single mothers, gotcha. or they came to the Source family with their uh, they a, a couple would come with with an infant or a small child. <clears throat> I know of one situation where a couple came with a small child, but. <clears throat> Excuse me. What was the attitude towards the children? Was it kind of, uh, I mean, in different organizations, they kind of have different approaches. What What was the Source family's approach to child rearing? Well, one thing was this was another discrepancy. There were a lot of discrepancies in the Source family because there was quote the company line or the family line about this is who we are and this is what we believe and this is what we do. And then there were the way things actually happened, which were completely incongruous with what was actually happening. So that's a way to create insanity, by the way, uh, or schizophrenia. It's called a double bind in psycho psychology terms. It's when something is being said, but a different behavior is acted out. And the person with a vulnerable mind is left extremely confused, vulnerable and becomes easily manipulated. So you see that dynamic as in, in far as the family. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I was just What's saying that? you see that dynamic in Scientology people. Yes. You know, yeah. Well, it's a cult. You know, it's a cult. Right. So, and I know I know that there are people who are involved with the source and going out and speaking about the source even now who think of it as you know just this wonderful spiritual fairy tale. But there was a very dark side to the source family and life in the source can you family. Talk about and as far that? as the children. Well, I want to finish the part about the children. The children who came to the family, the story was, the the family line was, it's all for the children. It's all about the children. The children are the most important. The children are going to carry the consciousness and lead the world. And we we had a real supremacist kind of philosophy in the Source family. We thought we were more conscious, higher, and smarter than everybody else. And everybody else was kind of an unconscious person, robotic person moving around in the Maya, which is the world of illusion. But we had the answers. We were the smart ones. We were the conscious ones. We were the curious of light. So our children were going to be the most powerful children on the planet is what the storyline was. So the children who were already born that came into the family were treated well. And then Yahweh had three of his own children in the family. One thing that's very interesting, I, I had... When I was, before I came to the Source family, at the age of um, 21, I had a near-death experience. I had a very serious surgery, and I died during that surgery. And um, 
it was a very profound experience. And I was, when I, when I came back and was recovering, I was told that I would never be able to have children, that they, that I had, that they had removed several tumors, but they left all of my organs in my, in my pelvis, but that I would never be able to bear children or have children. And so I never had, I never thought I could have kids and I didn't get pregnant and my husband and I didn't use any protection and I never got pregnant. And the, one of the first mornings I was at the source family, Yahoo in a very kind of seductive way looked at me and said, so sweetheart, when are you going to get pregnant? And I said, Oh, I can't get pregnant. I can't have children. And he kind of sided up to me and kind of laughed and said, well, we're going to see about that. Aren't we? Which can be taken a number of different ways. And do, do, you, uh, do you think that there was some kind of supernatural influence that allowed a pregnancy? Or how, well, how do you think that came about? I think that I may have cleaned up my body by the clean living and living in Hawaii and breathing fresh air and eating nutrient-dense foods. And I didn't even realize I was pregnant until I was three months pregnant because I, I didn't even imagine that I could be pregnant. And my pregnancy was very traumatic because it was during the time when we were living somewhere else in Hawaii. <clears throat> and I was very thin and there wasn't a lot of food. So I volunteered for kitchen duty every chance I could get. Clean up, kitchen cleanup duty. And in kitchen cleanup duty, I would eat the scraps that had been left. And on the rare occasion, I remember one time, literally almost starving. And one time someone had brought a fish. One of the sons had caught a fish and we had had fish that night. And I remember being so excited that I was doing cleanup in the kitchen that night. And I stayed up late to do cleanup. You don't get much sleep when you do kitchen cleanup because you're in the kitchen doing a lot of cleaning till, you know, you're not in bed at nine o'clock at night and you're still have to get up early the next morning. But I can remember reaching in the trash and getting that fish skin and sucking on that fish skin and chewing that fish skin and putting it through my teeth the way you put a, uh, an artichoke leaf through your teeth to get the insides out, doing that and sucking that, that fish skin because I was starving. I was pregnant. I was super thin. And when I was seven months pregnant, you couldn't even tell. I, my stomach was almost flat. And I remember... One of the women who were on the council, it was called the council, who were the women who were around Yehoah a lot of the time. I actually went to be with Yehoah and be one of those women, but I, I couldn't tolerate the, uh, it wasn't worth it. They were very bitchy, to be perfectly honest, and uh, very competitive and jealous and backstabbing and uh, Aom, who was his first wife, Robin, was very kind and loving to me. But the other women were not. They, it was like they were trying to take your things and take your clothes and be mean to you. So you'd leave because they didn't want you close to Yahoo. They wanted to get more time with him. They didn't want you to have any time with him. So, um, so you had two children while you were with the Source family. Is that correct? I had two children. I had one child that was born in the source family. Gotcha. And the, the, the thing that I wanted to mention about being so thin, I mean, I, I can remember one time, this is when we lived in Hilo, I took a nap in the afternoon and I woke up screaming. And the dream that I had was that I was reaching for a piece of cheese and someone was taking it away from me and saying, you know, you can't have it. And I woke up screaming, I want cheese, I want cheese. I was starving, I was pregnant. So one of the sons, one of the men in the family saw what was happening to me, and he was one of the men who had been there early on who went into town a lot. Uh, he had, he had, he had uh, come into the source family before I had, and he was one of the men who was able to go into town a lot for business or whatever. And he brought me some almonds, and he said, Yeho always said, when a woman's pregnant, she needs to eat almonds. And he, was, he gave me the almonds, and he gave me some cheese. And he was ostracized and told he was not able to leave the property any longer for a while because he had brought me some food. What was what was so your standard have, dietary what was your standard dietary intake in the source family? Let me go back to I want to finish this piece. Okay. So back to this piece is uh, 
the women who had you know, his children were not skinny like I was. And one of them uh, who had his son was, you know, definitely well-rounded. And I remember one time she had a picnic basket. And this is when we were living in the same place where I had woken up and where I had done the you know, kitchen duty at night and where I had woken up screaming, wanting cheese, which is so pathetic. My poor body was craving protein to make this baby. And she had this picnic basket and I happened to see her walking in the hallway. And I said, where are you going with the picnic basket? And she goes, Oh, I'm just going to take, you know, my son up to have a little picnic up on the hill. And I said, Oh, well, what's in the basket? Do you have food in there? And she turned around real quick and put the basket behind her back. And she said, it's just bananas. And she kind of snotty and she walked out. Well, I know it wasn't just bananas, but there was this selfishness among his women that was predominant, you know, that kind of uh, they were just in it for themselves. And the whole idea of, you know, helping others or being kind, no, none of that was in place. None of that was in place. As far as the diet, the diet changed upon, depending upon where we lived and depending upon what the situation was. When we were in the father house, we had beautiful organic food. And it was the same food that was served at the restaurant, and we had plenty of it. But the diet changed. You know, we would have different diets. He would, in morning meditation, he would say something like, we're going to go on a new diet now. From now on, I just want everyone to be eating almonds and dates and apples and raw milk cheese, maybe, or whatever it was. You know, he had different diets that he would put us on. And then maybe for a while, we'd be eating, you know, Altadena raw cottage cheese, and then he would take the dairy away. So there was, it was always changing. It was always changing. Do you think that but he used was, dietary intake to control his, uh, his, you know, people in the cult or the group? Well, I will tell you that what I know about nutrition and what I know about diet and what I know about mood now is that when you have a group of people and they are protein deprived or they're in a hypoglycemic hypoglycemic state, they are somnambulistic. <clears throat> somnambulistic. That's the term used in clinical hypnotherapy. Sleepwalkers. Somnambulistic means very easy to manipulate. Gotcha. Can you, we just kind of finish up with how, uh, how Father Yod or Yahoo, how he died and what happened after that and, you know, bring, kind of bring it full circle to where you are today. Well, he... Um, there were a few of us that were uh, with him on the big island on, on Oahu, excuse me, on Oahu. And I was there with him on Oahu with some of the women and two of the sons. The one that I, had, I was with at the time, Mercury, who I had been assigned to. Uh, Mercury was wonderful. It wasn't like a torture or anything. He was a beautiful man and we had a, a, a great relationship. So I was with Mercury and then Yahoo called me in one morning and he said, it's time for you to leave. Oahu, and you need to go back and be with Orbit. And that was it. Somebody put me on a plane, and I went back to be with Orbit and left Mercury. So he was there uh, with a few, some of his women, and he, Mercury, he kept Mercury there, and Mercury had been a hand glider. Mercury had set the world record for being in the air longer than anybody else at that time, 13 and a half hours in the air. Yeah. I was Mercury's woman at that time, and I was with him up on the hill, when he, up, up the cliffs of Makapu, when he set that world record. And so Yahoa said that he wanted to hand glide. And he'd never hand glided before. And so they went up on the hill and Mercury launched him and he went off the hand glider and he was soaring up in the air and then he, the wind changed and he crashed. And he was conscious down at the bottom of the cliff and laying on the ground. And uh, eventually he passed away we called it left the body in that house. And I remember being back on uh, the other island and the phone ringing outside. We had a pay phone outside of the house. And one of the sons answered the phone and I was standing there next to him. And he hung up the phone, he started laughing. And he said, father just left the body. And he was laughing and I said, that's not funny. Why would you say that? And he said, no, really, I just got a phone call from Oahu father just left the body and we all kind of were in a state of disbelief so we it took a long time for people to start to leave and to 
you know, we tried to stay together as long as we could. And uh, his mother, Angel, whose name was Makushla, continued to lead the family. Um, and we thought that she, that he had died looking in her eyes. And so he had transferred the consciousness into her. So we continued to stay together. And, but then people started to leave and, and spin off. And a lot of people came back to Los Angeles. Some people stayed in Hawaii. Uh, I stayed in Hawaii for a long time. And then I came back to Los Angeles and Orbit and I, got back together again in Los Angeles and flash forward to here I am now with my private practice in Valencia doing what I do. And, you know, I have this experience that was really profound. Would I do it again? No. One thing that is so important for people to know is that you have to always you can't blindly follow a leader. You can't, in politics, in spirit, in personal growth, anything. You can't just follow a leader. You have to use your brain, and you have to make sure you take care of yourself physically so you have enough protein to even think and keep yourself in the present and have your logic and reason so that you can make appropriate decisions for yourself. And it's really hard because human nature is to follow someone and human nature is to stick with the group. No one wants to be the outsider who's not sticking with the group and cults use that and play upon that. So my final words would be keep your head about you and don't follow anyone blindly and use your mind and constantly be going inside of yourself and saying, does this seem right? Is, is what, they're saying and doing, are they congruent? Is this authentic? Or is, are there differing things here? Because there were a lot of things that went on in the source family that should not have happened in a family that was, quote, loving and into health. And there were a lot of things that Yehoah, as, quote, the father of the family, should have been aware of that he chose to turn the other cheek and not be aware of. Things were happening that should not have happened. And that happens in any kind of situation like this. However, did I learn a lot from it? Yes. Was it a profound experience? Yes. Was it important for my personal growth? Yes. Am I glad I came out alive? Yes. Am I glad I have one foot on the ground and one foot in spirit? Yes. Am I glad that I'm grounded? Yes. I'm not spinning out on this story like some other people are who are still living as if the source is still around and people wanting to join it. It's not around. This family doesn't exist anymore. It was for that time and that place. We, it's kind of like a group of people who went to high school together. Yes, we all kind of still know each other. And some people hang on to those high school days like they were the best days of their lives. And they hang on to those high school days because that's when they were the star of the football team or the head of the cheerleading squad or something like that. But this is now. One of the things he taught us was be in the now, not living in the past. Gotcha. So uh, would those you are my have, parting I words. mean, other than that... Uh awesome statement you made would you what would your recommendation for people who are spiritual seekers who are looking for that and uh, how to avoid what you might have gotten caught up in um i'm glad i got caught up in it you know i'm glad that i i did what i did and learned what i learned but you know things happen that shouldn't have happened as far as what i would recommend is keep checking inside yourself your greatest leader and your greatest uh person that you have to answer to is the one your own higher consciousness your own higher self don't let anybody take away your power and don't let yourself get in situations where you know things aren't right but you stay because everybody else seems to be staying and everybody else seems to think it's okay you know there are a lot of wonderful spiritual teachers out there there's a lot of wonderful personal growth teachers out there and empowerment teachers out there learn what you can and move on move on don't become a robot excellent well that's excellent advice Dr. Elena Michaels, PhD, you are in Valencia. If people wanted to reach out to you, is there a way that you uh, would be able to be contacted? I don't mind if people contact okay. me. I'm, I like, I like educating people. I Good. mean, that's well, what I, I do in my life. Don't get my website, uh, drelena.com, D-R-E-L-E-N-A.com. And also I'm on Instagram, okay. uh, 
and Twitter. And my 24-hour number is 661-250-4395. 661-250-4395. Dr. Elena Michaels, thank you so much for being on the show. 